Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar with Dr. David Peck. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an edu independent educational grassroots charitable 501c3 non-membership organization. Its mission is to educate small scale sign liner and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in-person and online presentations. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year. We conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. Okay, well, welcome David and glad to have you here this evening. I'm very pleased to have been invited to join uh, really in this talk today is to do the same thing that I do in most of the talks that I give, which is get people to think about Varroa mites as their own organism. Think about the, the perspective of the mite, understand what fighting Varroa mites um, uh, really looks like in, in, a, in a, an informed context that takes into account the biology of the creature that you're trying to fight. Uh, and so, uh, you know, really the, the question that many people ask is, you know, why, why get a doctorate studying the way that honeybees and Varroa interact? Why study Varroa at all? And the answer that most people give is, is this, is that they just want to kill Varroa mites. That's the goal. And so they learn only as much as they need to, to figure out how to kill the mite that they're looking at or, you know, kill the mites that they're finding on their bees today. And I think that that winds up giving you a very limited perspective on the enemy that you're fighting. And so I wanna ask you to just think a little bit about what you know about this animal, this creature. What do you really know about the history or the biology of Varroa mites? And do you think that maybe there are some blind spots in your knowledge that if you explored could make you a better um, bee health manager? And so my learning objectives for this talk here are, are really to explore some of these most important aspects of Varroa biology. And I want to particularly talk a bit about mite transmission between colonies and, and maybe the, the effect that that might have on the seasonal mite levels that, that you may find. Uh, and finally, I do want to help to empower you a bit to develop your own year-round Varroa mite management plan to help you control mites in your hives. Um, and so I'd like to begin here. Uh, I think this is really where this story begins uh, in 1916. And in 1916, this red and, and sort of green line uh, was finally completed. This is the Trans-Siberian Railway. And as best we can piece together the biology, we believe that this was instrumental in the emergence of the Varroa mites that we've got in our bees. And the way that that happened was, we believe, beekeepers in Western Russia were finally able to transport bees all the way over to Eastern Russia. Uh, you know, in the area near Vladivostok, just north of the North Korean peninsula, uh, or the, rather the north of the northern tip of North Korea at this point. And so in this um, uh, transmission, this interaction between these beekeepers, uh, there was some uh, opportunity, they thought, to improve the honey production of beekeepers who were keeping bees in eastern Russia. Those beekeepers were keeping bees that could live in small hives, they would produce some appreciable amount of honey and wax that could be harvested, but they weren't terribly productive, they had a tendency to abscond or to swarm. And so they thought, well, why don't we hybridize them with some of our really productive uh, bees from, from over here in Western Russia, and we'll be able to really increase uh, the honey crop. The problem is they had made a mistake. And the mistake was they looked at these two honeybee populations and they thought that they were, you know, maybe, maybe uh, closely related cousins of each other, but they are in fact two different species of bee. In the upper right hand corner, we've got um, uh, Apis mellifera, the western honeybee that, that we all keep. And then in the lower corner, we have uh, Apis serrana, which is sometimes called the Asian honeybee or is more appropriately called the eastern honeybee. They're closely related, their, their lifestyle is very similar. They have a queen, they make combs, they swarm, you know, they do all of the things that our bees do, but they're not bees that you can hybridize. And so we believe that any of these efforts to, to improve honey production probably failed. And as a result, you know, the beekeepers probably dejected, went home and said, well, I guess this isn't for us. I guess we can't, we can't uh, you know, achieve our goals. And so they went back and continued keeping their bees elsewhere in Russia. And the problem is that the Russians made a very understandable mistake in trying to put these bees together, but another organism made a mistake as well. And that organism is 
uh, the varroa mite, what we now call varroa destructor. Uh, what we believe happened, what we've pieced together from the genetics of the mites that are available to us to study, is that some of these mites uh, that were living on the eastern honeybee, the Apis serrana, very happily living there, not causing a tremendous amount of harm, just you know, spreading and, and growing as any parasite of any organism does, they made that same mistake. They jumped into the Apis mellifera colonies and said, hmm, you know, these seem like our bees, why don't we go in and, and try to live here? The problem is that over time, they developed adaptations that made them a more and more dangerous parasite. And the most important of them is probably that they gained the ability to reproduce inside worker brood, not just in drone brood. Uh, and so this is a, one of my favorite graphics that I like to show, which is just an animated um, graphic that shows the spread of varroa around the world. So the varroa mites were first found on Eastern honeybees in Indonesia. Uh, and that was, you know, just a curiosity until some, some universities in the 40s started reporting the presence of these strange mites on bees within the Soviet Union. And so they then uh, confirmed their presence in Asia, but much more importantly, we see that in Germany and uh, some Eastern European countries, uh, and then immediately in Paraguay and Brazil, we detect varroa mites in the 70s. And then they continue to spread uh, through that time. The way that the mites spread across the Atlantic Ocean was because beekeepers were mailing queens, mailing bees back and forth to each other because they, they weren't practicing good biosecurity. In 1987, they arrived in North America. Uh, in 1992, they got into Great Britain. And then uh, in 90, when is it? Oh, now I have to watch my graph. In 98, they arrived in Ireland. The North Island of New Zealand is hit with varroa mites in 2000, and then the South Island 2006. The next year, they arrive in Hawaii. And this figure ends in 2009. I actually spent some time in Madagascar, which is white in this graphic, uh, because the varroa arrived there somewhere between 2010 and 2012, and has really devastated the native population uh, of the, the race of honeybees that live in Madagascar. And so the point of this is simply to show that, that these are a very new threat to our bees. These are a very recent threat. And also they are, they are um, incredibly effective at spreading. And they're clearly being assisted by humans in some of this spread, but it's not entirely our fault. It's also that these mites are very good at spreading from colony to colony. So that's something we'll explore today. Uh, what is the biology of this animal? Uh, you know, as I said, what do you know about them? Um, well, it you know, may be a surprise or may not be a surprise that because they're mites, they are arachnids. They have eight legs, not six, and they're more closely related to spiders and ticks than they are to our bees. Uh, that's an advantage to us in some ways, because it means that if you have a chemical that kills arachnids and doesn't kill insects, perhaps you can use it to kill the mites and not kill the bees that they're infesting. Um, they don't have antennae because they aren't insects. And so they don't have the ability to smell the world with, with those little antennae like our bees do. But they do have sensory hairs on their forelegs. And they can hold those legs up, and they can wave them around, and they can sort of sniff the environment with them. Uh, the head of the varroa mite is sort of in the middle of this photograph. They've got long mouth parts that they use to pierce the, the bees and consume nutrients from them. But the head of the varroa mite doesn't have any eyes on it. They're completely blind. Uh, and so maybe that can be something we can use to our advantage as well. Um, and so all of the varroa mites body is, is perfectly tuned to get into and, and exploit a honeybee colony and even the body of a honeybee. And they've, they are that way because they've been infesting uh, Apis serrana, the Eastern honeybee for as far as we know, perhaps millions of years. But they've only been on Western honeybees. They've only been recognized as this new, you know, slightly modified varroa mite, varroa destructor, since you know, perhaps 100 years ago or, or even less. And so this is a very, very new threat for our bees. But the, these mites are doing more or less what they've been doing for a very long time. Uh, this is a slightly less intimidating photo that I like to use. This sort of looks like you know, the towering monster. And, and this makes a little clearer the, the size and scope of the enemy that we're fighting here. Um, there are two behavioral modes that varroa mites have, and it's important to understand what they are. There's the reproductive mode where the mites are going into brood cells, they're feeding on the developing bees, and they're laying eggs. There's also the phoretic or dispersal mode, uh, and the, those names are sometimes used interchangeably. 
In this mode, the mites are riding around on adult bees, they're inside the hive, they're feeding typically on nurse bees, and they consume, uh, they get energy by feeding on the bees' fat bodies. And the fat body is an organ inside an insect. It's sort of like the, the liver of the bee, but it's got a lot of you know, nutritious fats in it, and so the varroa mites are able to consume and, and exploit that. Uh, and we know that, that varroa mites go through multiple cycles in their lives. We estimate that it could be about three reproductive cycles per, per mite, although it's very hard to nail this down. It's quite hard to design a study where you can really track a varroa mite naturally through, through her whole life and, and through her reproductive process. So in that reproductive mode, what's actually happening? Well, at the very beginning, a varroa mite, a female varroa mite, runs into a cell that is about to be capped. And she typically hides herself down in the food at the bottom of that cell, the food meant for that, that bee to eat before it gets to the end of its feeding stage and starts to, to develop further. Once that bee is capped and, and ready to begin the pupation process, and once the food is gone, the varroa mite climbs up and starts feeding on the bee. And she feeds, and then she goes up typically to the top of the cell, the top surface of the cell, because the bee is lying down on the bottom, and she defecates up there. And then she goes back and eats some more. And then she goes back and defecates in the same spot. She begins laying eggs. The first egg that she lays is a, an unfertilized egg that grows up into a male. So by a happenstance of biology, varroa mites and honeybees use the same sex determination system, where unfertilized eggs grow up into boys and fertilized eggs grow up into girls. So this first male egg grows up, he starts feeding on the bee, he goes up and he relieves himself at the same spot that his mother has been using and goes back and feeds some more and he grows and matures. And then after that first male is produced, the varroa mite is going to lay a series of subsequent eggs that all grow up into females. And they will do the same thing. They feed on the bee, they go and relieve themselves at the same you know, predetermined defecation site. And then they go back and feed again and, and so on and so forth until all of the young mites start to approach sexual maturity. At that point, the male is going to incestuously mate with his sisters, impregnate them, and then they will, uh, they actually do that, we believe, at the, the feces pile that their mother has been accumulating since she arrived in that cell. And so that's sort of the, the rendezvous site that she sets up for her offspring to mate with each other. At the end of the process, the, the bee, weakened but still alive, is going to crawl out of that cell, but is going to have uh, this varroa mite, the, the mother mite, still riding on it. And we'll also now have these new pregnant female varroa mites uh, riding on the bee's body. The male is left behind, any immature females are left behind, and they're all cleaned out by the bees, like so much trash uh, produced at the end of, of the bee development process. But what that means is that most of the varroa mites that you are likely to encounter are pregnant and female. Um, the reproductive mode you know, can be detected. There's some evidence left behind. And one of the clearest signs of that is guanine, which is just the scientific term for mite poop. Um, you, know, you can compare it to the word guano, meaning bird or bat droppings. But this guanine, these little white speckles, are, are what is found when a varroa mite has reproduced inside a cell. So if you take a frame and tilt it upwards, you can find these, these little residues. The other mode, the other life stage of the varroa mite is this phoretic or dispersal mode, where they're riding around on bees and also feeding on them. So this is a photograph that I took through the glass wall of an observation hive. Uh, where you can see that some of these bees are, are down on the combs walking around, but other bees are facing us, they're walking on the glass. And of those bees that are facing us, we can see that a large number of them, the circles here, have one or more varroa mites on their bodies. And we know that the varroa mites are, are preferentially hiding themselves on the undersides of the abdomens of these bees, and are in fact specifically going to, to the left side of the bee before they wedge themselves underneath the bee's overlapping abdominal plates and then nestle in there to feed on the, the body of the bee. And so this is another photo that shows a little bit better um, multiple varroa mites that have wedged themselves underneath those overlapping abdominal plates. It's important to remember that our bees don't have just one continuous sheet of armor over themselves. Their exoskeleton is these overlapping plates, and that gives the varroa mites a spot that they can actually wedge their bodies and, and hide from the grooming activity of the bees.
Um, so in Apis serrana, the eastern bee, the original host, as I said, the varroa mites only infest drone brood. They're only on the male bees that are developing and male bees are, are not reared in great numbers throughout the year. And so the varroa mites have a limited opportunity to reproduce. They also, if more than one mite goes into the same drone cell and tries to reproduce in there, that is generally producing a strong enough signal that the Eastern honeybees can recognize it and they actually are known to entomb multiple mites. So if you have a drone and, and multiple mites at the same time, the bees will pack extra wax over the outside of that cell, suffocate and smother the, the drone, but also suffocate and smother those mites. And so it can be a really effective way to keep the population from getting too high. In our bees, the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, multiple mites, uh, uh, sorry, rather more mites can be produced in a drone cell than in a worker cell. So they will preferentially go in and infest drone brood. And that's just because male bees take longer to ripen. They're capped for, for more time. And so there's more opportunity for the mites to, to have more offspring. But they also infest worker brood. Uh, and so that means that there are, are more opportunities for mite reproduction. And it also means that the mites are interacting not just with the male bees, but also with the all important workers. And the, the big problem there is that in addition to feeding on these bees, weakening them, taking a little bit of nutrition, which is perhaps something that our bees would be able to cope with, uh, even at high mite levels, these mites also transmit viruses between our bees. And research has shown that actually a lot of these viruses did not originate with the varroa mites. They didn't originate with the, the eastern honeybees in Asia. A lot of these viruses have been in western honeybees our honeybees for a very long time. But they were spread very slowly by bees that would you know, exchange food mouth to mouth with one another and maybe transmit virus particles at the same time. Uh, things like deformed wing virus, sac root virus, chronic bee paralysis virus, a, a number of these viruses that we know the varroa mites can transmit um, are, are really sort of having a field day now that they've got this totally new way of spreading from bee to bee to bee to bee as the mites are feeding on them. And so of these, the, in many ways, the most famous and most recognizable is deformed wing virus. We can see a, a photo here of bee, a bee with deformed wings, um, which is, is indicative of a very high level of this virus. A bee can have deformed wing virus in her body and not have wing deformities. Um, but when the virus levels get high enough, this is what we tend to see in, in an increasing number of the bees. So the, this is a, a figure that I've taken from uh, Nod, who manufacture um, some mite control products. It's very clearly in large part based on Randy Oliver's models of varroa mite and bee populations over the course of, of a year. But what I really like about it is that it, it lets us have a conversation about what is happening in our bees over the course of a year. We hopefully know that because we're beekeepers, but also a conversation about what's probably happening in the mite population over that same time. So we can see this yellow line is showing us that in January, February, our bee population is about as low as it's going to be throughout the year. We know that bees don't have all that many bees at the end of winter. And then over the course of the spring, they're going to build up very dramatically. We also see that the varroa mite population is at about its lowest level uh, early in the year. They're coming in very, very uh, you know, um, sparse within the bee population. Uh, but as the bee population grows, as there's new brood and more brood and more brood and more brood and more brood, there are more opportunities for the varroa mites to reproduce. And so that means that there's a bit of a lag, but as the bee population climbs, so too does the mite population. And that, that mite population can eventually get extraordinarily high, even in comparison to the bee population. Then later on in the season, we can see that we've got you know, a decline in both of those populations. Um, but what's very important about this is an understanding that the harm that the varroa mites do, that virus transmission, is something that is caused over time as more and more and more mites feed on more and more and more bees. And so if you, if you look at an image like this and you think back to you know, any calculus that you did in high school or college, you might think, well, you know, uh, I know that we can see this line, but what's the area under the curve? What is the, the integral of this, this mite feeding that's happening? What is happening is more and more mite feeding accumulates. And essentially what we know is that the more mite feeding that takes place in a colony, the higher the virus levels are going to become. 
um, at least certain viruses that, that tend to follow that pattern. What that means is that if I'm a beekeeper and I'm looking at, at a mite and bee population like this, I might think that I'm really clever going in and killing absolutely every single Varroa mite in my colony on October 1st. But the issue is all of the mites that I've killed, you know, on up to October 1st, and let me see if I can get a little pen here. If I go in here and I kill every Varroa mite right here, if, if this mite population level suddenly plummets to, to absolutely to zero, I've eliminated the mites that might cause trouble for my bees in the fall, maybe the next spring. But what I have not eliminated is all of the mite feeding that has happened up to this point in the year. All of the virus transmission that might have taken place up to this point is still going to have happened. And so it's important to understand that controlling mites and controlling the viruses they spread means that it's really a year round problem. And it means that the mite population needs to be kept low and not just brought low at one point of the year. So your goal is year round mite control. Dead mites just before winter begins doesn't mean that your bees can't, don't have any mite related problems if you had really high mite levels and virus levels earlier uh, in the season. It, this also means that if any mites survive your treatments, or if you have mite transmission, if you've got mites that are entering the hive from, from outside, your mite fight isn't over just because you've killed a bunch of them at one point in the year. Keeping your varroa mite level low year round is complicated. It requires attention. It requires a good understanding of the, the creatures you're fighting. It probably requires monitoring those mite levels but it's also likely going to be the healthiest option for your bees. If you can keep the mite levels low instead of just bringing them low after they've spiked, you're likely to have better outcomes. So now I'd like to talk about that idea of mites coming into a colony that has maybe had all of its mites recently killed by a really effective treatment. Uh, and so to talk about transmission, we need to be clear about what we're talking about. Are we talking about how mites are transmitted from bee to bee? Not really. How does it happen? It's pretty straightforward. The mite can simply jump from bee to bee as they brush past each other, or the mite can get down and walk on the comb and then jump back up onto another bee. What I find much more interesting is this idea. How do varroa mites get from a colony that has a lot of them into a colony that perhaps has none? You know, if I've got hive box number one and hive box number two, how are these mites getting from, from A to B, from one to two? Well, there are different ways that, that a disease can spread. Uh, and one of the ways that we talk about in biology is vertical transmission, the spread of, of a disease from a parent to its offspring. And so in this case, it, we imagine that if we have a sick colony or a colony that has mites, and then they swarm, and then that swarm takes up residence somewhere else, well, now we've got two colonies that both have varroa mites because the varroa are going to be on the bees that are in that swarm. This isn't you know, terribly surprising. It's, it's a pretty straightforward way of spreading, but it's important to understand that as sick colonies spread and, and you know, produce more, more swarms, more offspring, the varroa mites are able to be sustained in their population that way. Horizontal transmission is in some ways a lot more interesting. Horizontal transmission just means the spread of a disease between unrelated individuals, unrelated organisms. So in this case, two hives that, that have no meaningful relationship with one another, other than they might be nearby, um, how mites might spread from colony A to colony B? Well, one mechanism is straightforward, and that's the drift of bees that are carrying varroa mites from the sick colony into the healthy one. Uh, and we know that this happens. We know that it can happen over, over many distances. And we know that drift is a, a, a common phenomenon across the, the globe. Our bees are doing it. Another mechanism is robbing. It's the, the spread of mites where healthy bees leave their colony, go into a sick colony. Perhaps the colony is, is you know, easily uh, uh, undefended and, and available for, for robbers to come and exploit because they are sick with varroa and varroa spread viruses. But these robbers go in, they steal some honey, but maybe they also pick up a varroa mite on their way home. And so this is another mechanism that the mites can use to spread from colony to colony. Uh, it's important when we talk about robbing to have a clear understanding of what we mean. And so many beekeepers are familiar with, with what, what I call overt robbing, which is just robbing that is so obvious that you, you'd have to be blind not to see it. 
Uh, and so here are some photos and we've got this little animation here of some bees coming in in the middle of a, a summer dearth and very aggressively trying to rob the, the honey that are inside these, these boxes here. So this is obvious. If you see this, you could easily understand that, that you, you, know, you might have an, an opportunity for disease spread from one colony to another. But there's also covert robbing. This is an, a, a, a clip of video that I took, and it's going to just play on repeat, where we had a colony that had very, very light colored bees, yellow colored bees. But some of the colonies nearby were very, very dark colored. They were black. And so these yellow, these cordovan bees, are guarding their colony. But if you look closely, you can see that there's some grappling. There's some fighting taking place at the entrance. And if you look particularly closely, you'll see that that's often fighting between a black bee and a yellow bee. Those black bees were invaders. They were robbers who were coming in and trying to steal resources from this colony, but the guard bees were, were having none of that. And so if you're a beekeeper looking at a, a colony like this, if you, unless you're looking very closely, you might not notice that robbing taking place. But there are ways to detect it. So in this case, I put a, an inverted uh, hive cover just in front of the, the colony. And this was 24 hours after I put it there. I went and took this photograph. And what you can see is that we've got lots of yellow guard bees up on, the, uh, up on the entrance. And below, we have a very large number of dead bees who have just recently been cast out of this hive. The majority of them are black, although some of them are, are yellow. Some of them are the guard bees that were slowly getting overwhelmed as this robbing took place. And so this was the result of an experiment that we did to just try to go and study this simple question. We know that varroa mites can spread via drift. We know that varroa mites can spread via, via robbing, but which of those is more important? Which of those is, is having a bigger impact? Uh, you know, which, if either of them, are meaningfully leading to, to changes in the varroa population of some of these colonies? And so to set up this experiment, and I'll, I'll just talk about this sort of briefly here, um, we did this. We, we set up a few colonies, three colonies in this case, that had very high levels of varroa mites. And those three colonies were headed by bright yellow bees. Perhaps you can understand where I got the, the video that I just showed you. So we've got sick colonies, they've got lots of mites, but they also have very, very distinct yellow colored bees in them. One meter away to the east and west, we had two other colonies. They had very low levels of mites, but they had dark colored bees. They had black bees uh, living inside of them. And so this meant that I could go and I could look and say, you know, if I see a yellow bee going into the wrong hive or a black bee going into the wrong hive, I can start to piece together which bees are interacting under what circumstances and how that might be, you know, explaining some of the mite transmission that, that we might observe. We were also interested in whether distance had any effect here. And so in this experiment, we also put some of these dark bees, these mite-free black bees, 50 meters to either side of the little apiary, and we also put some more of these black bees um, 300 meters to the east and west. And so that meant that we had this little array of bees that were, were you know, interacting with one another, and we were able to monitor the varroa levels in those colonies over time. And so this is, is just one graph that we produced in this study. These are the lines of the varroa populations in the, um, what we call the MRCs, the mite receiver colonies. And what we found was that Soon after we started the experiment and put the bees together, uh, which happened right here around, um, around uh, just before September 1st, we saw that already there was some increase in the detectable mite levels. So here, these, these bees were not put next to one another. And then as soon as they were moved into the apiary, we saw the mite levels starting to climb. So that makes clear that, you know, that there, there is, is almost immediate transmission of mites within this little apiary. But what we then saw is these two dotted lines here, the, the fine dotted line and then the bolder dotted line, were the dates that we observed, first of all, very minor robbing, some of that covert robbing, and then secondary, when we saw the first cases of really overt robbing, where the, the robber bees were simply overwhelming the guards. And so in that robbing period, you can see that we, we detected some pretty dramatic increases in the mite populations in many of these mite receiver colonies. And so this led us to the conclusion that what was probably happening here was that mites were being spread via drift, but that robbing was having a really dramatic impact. And only a few days of robbing were having these, these sort of outsized impacts on the mite population. 
Uh, by comparison, this is just a, a, a graph here that shows, again, those same black low mite colonies from the start of the experiment in, in early August and you know, through September until uh, the end of the experiment. And what you can see is that the number of wrong colored workers, that is the number of yellow bees from those sick hives that were showing up in the, the dark colored colonies is relatively low throughout the whole experiment. But what we saw was that particularly these colonies that were very close to the yellow hives, one E and one W, one East and one West, we saw some, a fair amount of, of uh, uh, you know, mite transmission, or rather a fair amount of, of drift taking place, you know, these, these wrong colored bees um, throughout the experiment. But at this point, around September 24th, this is where we saw robbing taking place. And clearly the chaos of the robbing meant some of those yellow bees were actually going into the, the black colonies nearby. So, so it led to a huge actual increase in, in what we interpreted as drift, even though we believe that robbing was really what triggered it. Um, and this is just, just the drone side of things to, to emphasize that yes, the drones are potentially a big part of this. Um, we can see here the green lines are showing the percent of, of off-color drones. So again, the percent of yellow drones that were showing up in these black colonies. And what you can see is that really over the course of the experiment, we've got quite a large number of drone drift. At one point, we had one of the colonies, 50% uh, of their drones were not from that colony. They were from the colony nearby. And so that was likely a, a, a dramatic impact on the mite transmission. But we, can, we saw that the the one meter away colonies had a large number of drones, wrong colored drones. But then the red lines here are showing you the colonies that were 50 meters to the east and the west. And you'll see that there's, there are you know, maybe up five, up to approaching 10% wrong colored drones, but very, very few of them. Uh, this right here was the only time we saw a drone who had drifted 300 meters away. And, and the, that drifted into just one of the two 300 meter colonies. And so this shows, again, that, that drift is taking place, that there's both worker and drone drift, but that robbing is also uh, potentially having an important role in the spread of these mites. And so our overall conclusions were these. It's that drift is probably happening continuously, and that it can happen over long distances. But in, at least in our experiment, we saw that it seemed to rapidly decline as the interhive distance increased. That is, the further away from the sick colony, the less drift we were seeing uh, on a continuous basis. Um, we interpreted the robbing that we saw as both sudden and brief, but also a good way to spread mites. And it didn't provide, there was no protective effect of distance. As long as those robbers could find and rob and exploit the sick colonies, we found that the, the colonies 300 meters away, 50 meters away, or one meter away, didn't have any appreciable uh, detectable difference in the number of mites that, that appeared in those colonies soon afterwards. So those are, are just two mechanisms of mite spread that are important to keep in mind when you're managing your own mite population. If you kill all of the mites, but you have opportunities for drift and robbing to take place, the mites could still spread. You could still have an import of mites after you've killed them all in, in your hive. There's one other mechanism that I do like to talk about, just more because it's fun than because I think it's very important in mite transmission, and that's this indirect pathway. The idea that you could have a, a colony that has a lot of mites sending foragers out and they might have varroa mites on them. Those varroa mites may find themselves you know, left on a flower. Maybe the mite jumps off. Maybe the bee gets eaten by a spider and the mite is left out there. And then perhaps another bee comes in, forages on that flower and brings the mite home. And so this was something that had been talked about for a number of decades. Uh, there, were, there had been papers published where varroa mites had been found on shipments of flowers. And then the USDA inspectors had to speculate and say, we don't know if this is actually you know, a varroa mite that could have wound up in a bee colony. We don't know if she could have spread and carried whatever weird you know, foreign viruses she's, she's brought in inside her body. But you know, if that was a possible mechanism of spread, it could be quite dire. And so again, taking my perspective that I, I like to adopt, the idea that, that the varroa mite is an interesting animal in its own right, I set out to do an experiment where we simply said, could a varroa mite on a flower actually get onto a forager and ride it home? Are they even capable of that? Uh, and so I'll, I'll just quickly show here, um, 
the title of the video sort of gives it away. But here we can see we've put one varroa mite on this flower. A forager is going to arrive and the varroa mite very quickly, remember this is an animal that has no eyes, detects that that is a honeybee, climbs up onto it. And if you look closely, I think this plays again in slow motion. Um, yeah, you'll see that the varroa mite turns, gets onto the bee's leg, quickly navigates, it almost appears to jump onto the bee's abdomen, and then actually runs across the top surface of the abdomen and hides herself away in that bee's waist. And that happened before the bee was even able to detect that, that something funny had happened. We saw that the bees generally started grooming soon after the mites got onto them, but essentially all of the mites that we put out on those flowers wound up infesting bees and then riding them back to the apiary. Uh, and so um, our interpretation is, no, this is probably not a common mechanism of mite transmission, but it is certainly something that these mites are capable of. And it could happen that if you killed every single mite in your apiary, and the only possible way for mites to get in would be if, if you know, your neighbor's bees dropped some mites on flowers and your bees picked them up. This is a mechanism that allows the mites to potentially come back in. So there's, varroa mites are not a problem that you're going to be able to solve permanently. It's going to be a problem that has to be managed continuously. So all of these natural mechanisms of mite transmission are certainly important to understand. There are also non-natural mechanisms. If you are a beekeeper who is moving bees from a sick colony into a healthy colony, if you're moving brood, if you're even moving frames or boxes or, or you know, your hive tool, you could spread the occasional mite. But certainly if you are spreading bees or if you're spreading brood between colonies, that gives an excellent opportunity for these mites to spread. And of course, you the beekeeper, depending upon how you manage your bees, could also be promoting or, or leading to drift or robbing. Some of these other you know, more natural mechanisms could be happening at an unnaturally high rate if you don't keep them under control. So the summary of all of this is, is again, that drift seems like it's happening constantly. It can be very significant, but it might be more significant the closer together your hives are. Robbing is happening sporadically. But if it does happen, it seems like it could lead to very intense mite transmission over long distances. Um, in that paper, we suggested that, that sick hives were probably better at transmitting mites. The sicker they are, the more easy it is to rob them. And so we thought that maybe the, the term robber lure would be more appropriate than the term mite bomb to describe them. A mite bomb suggests that you've got a bunch of sick bees and mites sort of blasting out of that one, that one sick colony. We suggested, no, what's happening is this colony is just getting so pathetic that it's luring in all of these robbers, but then punishing them by infesting them with all of these mites. Um, and then our other conclusion was that if you had bees in a natural setting like a forest where the colonies might be kilometers apart from one another, you're probably going to have less drift, perhaps even less robbing, but not enough to completely prevent the spread of mites. And so these are very good uh, animals that are very good at transmitting themselves. Uh, and it means that you as a beekeeper are not going to be able to completely isolate yourself from the, the overall population of bees and mites in your landscape. So when you think about your own bees, it's important to think about when robbing is likely to occur. Typically, robbing is going to happen most significantly during dearths. If your bees can go make an honest living visiting flowers, they will probably do so. But if they can't, that foraging force can become a marauding robbing force. So in our areas of upstate New York, both where we did the experiment and where I live now, autumn tends to be a very serious time for robbing because there are a lot of foragers, but there are no remaining flowers for them to go and visit. When does drift occur in your bees? Well, in a sense, it happens whenever your bees are flying. Every time a bee leaves a hive, she might make a mistake and go into the wrong colony uh, when she comes home. But there are things that might promote drift. If you're moving colonies around, if you're leaving foragers to, to return to an apiary where their box has been taken off somewhere else, and now they've got to go somewhere, somewhere else, uh, or they'll starve to death, now you're promoting drift. If all of your boxes are identical and all face the same direction, if you've got a huge density of hives all in the same area, that might increase the chances that your bees are going to be um, making orientation mistakes. Some research that was done in the 60s by Jay found that um, in some cases, you can actually go in and figure out you know, how many bees inside a colony, how many of the foragers in a colony weren't born there, drifted in from elsewhere. And in some of those studies, you know, they were finding that the bees might, might 
have 50% of a colony's foraging force might not have actually been born there. It might have just been free drifters, you know, bouncing around between all of these identically painted hives. Um, and so another thing to keep in mind, though, is if you have no mites nearby, whether you've, you know, killed them all or if there are just no other bees near your single hive out in the middle of the wilderness, then there won't be any mite transmission. So the more mites that you can reduce in the overall landscape around your bees, perhaps the less of a risk this transmission is. Um, so if you want to keep your mites mo low, you want to keep drift and robbing to a minimum, and you also want to reduce the number of mite infested colonies nearby. If you've got a sick colony in an apiary, it might make sense to treat that whole apiary so that mites aren't able to bounce back and forth between them. If you have neighbors who are beekeepers, it might be worth having a conversation about their mite management strategy, because you certainly don't want them to um, uh, to be experiencing, to be breeding mites that then your bees have to have to suffer through when they're transmitted in. And if there are swarms that are taking up residence in trees or walls around you, you need to consider the implications of that for your own bees. Uh, one mechanism that, or one tool that I do recommend that people look into are robbing screens. Uh, robbing screens are, are essentially just baffles that trick robbers into approaching the wrong part of a, of a hive entrance. And so in this case, um, the hive entrance is, is down at the bottom of the hive. The robbers are naturally attracted to the smell of ripening nectar down here, or, or perhaps even in the screen. And so the robbers come in and try to enter, but they can't get in. In fact, the, only the bees that live here know that they've got to walk up here and, and leave via this sort of upper hatch and then return back through there in order to get back into the hive. Uh, and over here, this is just another design of the same thing. You've got this, this area that allows the fragrance of the hive out, so the robbers are all trying to get in right there, but in fact, the, the resident bees know that they've got to go out and return through these, these little upper hatches. Uh, so if you are going to be controlling varroa mites in your bees, and I encourage you to do so, it's important that you have some kind of a monitoring plan. And so I, I want you to just very quickly think about these two questions. What is valuable? What do you learn that is important to know about your bees if you measure the mite levels before you treat them? And then what valuable information do you get by measuring those mite levels after you treat them? What's the benefit to measuring before treatment? What's the benefit to measuring afterwards? Well, as we think about this, hopefully you're, you're starting to come to the conclusion, well, if I, if I know the mite level before I treat, maybe I can decide that I don't need to treat this week. If I, if I go out and I do a mite monitoring test and I determine that all of the bees in my apiary have very low mites, I can save myself a little money. I can save my bees some stress by not putting in a mite treatment. If I go out and the mite levels are sort of in the middle, then, then maybe I'll, I'll start thinking about whether or not I, I need to be doing some kind of a treatment pretty soon. If the mite levels are sky high, I know that I really need to get on top of this as soon as possible. And I might need to sort of baby my bees over the course of the season uh, to try to keep them healthy enough to, to get through the next winter. Um, the valuable information that you get after a treatment is whether or not your treatment worked. So if you are just using treatments and assuming that that's keeping your mite level under control, if you've got, you know, a 10% mite infestation, and then you buy a treatment and use it. So you're, somebody says, hey, I've got this magical snake oil. You put three drops on the queen and it'll kill every mite in your hive. Well, you can do it, but if you don't go back and confirm that the mites are dead, now you're going to, to have made assumptions about controlling those mites when you didn't really have the impact you thought you did. So uh, I, I won't go through all of the, the different mite monitoring techniques in great detail, but I'll just briefly uh, mention a few things. First of all, uh, there is a kind of insufficient monitoring that a lot of beekeepers do. Many beekeepers that I talk to say, I, my bees are dead and I don't know why. And I say, what were your mite levels? And they say, I checked for mites all the time. I never had them. I say, how did you check? And they say, well, I, I just looked for them and I never saw them. Every time I went in and lifted up a frame, I looked for mites and I couldn't find a one of them. Well, the problem with that, if we think back to our Varroa biology lesson, is what that phoretic mode looks like. These mites in this photograph are all on the undersides of these bees. There are a lot of bees in this photograph whose backs we can see who are living with these very, very sick bees. They've probably got mites too. But by looking at the back of a bunch of honeybees on a frame, you're not going to see them. So unless your inspection involves making your bees walk on a piece of glass and then looking up from underneath, 
you're not going to detect all of these varroa mites, not to mention all of the mites inside the brood that you aren't going to see unless you're going in and opening up brood cells. Uh, so there are better monitoring techniques that you can use. One of them is using a screened bottom board and a, a sticky board. I, I find this to be very useful as a supplement to my own mite monitoring. It's not quite as accurate as other methods because, you know, if 10 mites fall underneath a colony, you know, it matters whether or not that colony has two frames of bees or 50 frames of bees in it. Uh, and so you've got to be able to, to make some, some calculations and interpretations, but this is still a useful mechanism to go in, stick a, a sticky board under your colony and see how many mites are falling over the course of three days, and then dividing that by three to figure out how many are falling per day. There are other methods though that tend to be considerably more useful. Those are the sample-based methods where you go and collect a sample of 300 bees, which is equivalent to a half cup of bees, and then going through, you could use something like the sugar shake method, where you take those 300 bees, cover them in about two tablespoons of powdered sugar, let them sit for a couple of minutes. And this is important. A lot of people forget this. But you have to let them sit so that those bees get agitated and start grooming themselves, increase their body temperature. And, and those mites start moving around and saying, hey, why is my bee so upset? What's going on? And then get covered in that sugar and, and get knocked off. Uh, and then you simply shake the bees through the screened lid of your jar, dissolve the sugar with some water, and then you're left to count how many mites there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Do I have to treat or not? Let me consult my chart. Uh, the more foolproof method though is the alcohol wash, which is a, a, a reliable method to take 300 bees, kill them in alcohol, and then also kill their mites, and then use some kind of a sieve to, to separate those mites and bees from one another. And so there are different ways that you can do this. You can get a product like the Varroa Easy Check here, which is essentially just a little uh, a plastic jar with a little colander in it that allows the mites and the, the alcohol to pass through underneath, but holds the bees up top and you can toss them in the grass and carry on with your checks. Uh, you can also do something like this. This is a, a photo from Randy Oliver's website where he's certainly uh, you know, made a more efficient and perhaps cost-effective uh, you know, uh, mite monitoring system where he's got a bowl, he's got a, a colander, and he can reuse that alcohol multiple times once he's, he's you know, fished the mites out uh, from underneath the bees. There are also some monitoring signs that people rely on that really indicate that things have already gone far too far. So if you are looking at your mites or rather looking at your bees and you're finding huge numbers of these guanine residues, huge amounts of that mite poop building up on the frames, that can be a sign that perhaps the mite levels have already gotten too high. If you see something like this, if you see what we sometimes call shotgun brood or is sometimes called parasitic mite syndrome, this is an indication that lots of bees are dying, lots of brood are, are being half removed as they, they succumb to viruses or as the bees are, are trying to remove all of these infested cells where the mites are, are trying to reproduce. This can be a sign that, that your mite level really has gotten to catastrophic levels. Uh, and here we just have a, a photo of some bees that have deformed wings. And again, if you see lots of bees with deformed wings crawling in the grass, you can pat yourself on the back and be confident that you've correctly diagnosed a mite problem. But even if you kill every single varroa mite, that's not going to kill every single virus particle. And so you're, you're still going to be suffering from the effects of those mites, even if the mites themselves are removed from the picture. So what have we learned today about Varroa that might help us actually control them? Well, we know that Varroa can be either phoretic or reproductive. Um, it's, it's again, very, very variable throughout the year, but in, in much of the summer, we expect roughly 50% of the mites to be reproductive and roughly 50% to be phoretic. It can be considerably more than that. It can be up to two thirds or, or maybe even more mites reproducing in the brood at some times of year. But you know, you can approximate it at about 50%. But in the late fall and the early winter or, or midwinter, when you have no brood, obviously all of the mites have to rely on that phoretic life's, uh, life process. We've learned that it's easy to measure the varroa mite population. There's a lot of different techniques you can use, but it's very hard to guess it. So if you're not monitoring, you don't really have an accurate picture of what your mite situation is. We know that these bees can reproduce on workers and drones, but they prefer reproducing on drones. And we know that the mite population has to be kept continuously low to help to reduce the amount of, of virus transmission that's going to take place. 
Um, we also know that if you treat a colony, mites can come in from outside. There's a number of mechanisms that they can use to do that. But it means that if you kill all of your mites, that doesn't mean you've destroyed your mite problem forever. It just means you've killed some of the mites that were in the colony during that treatment. Uh, and of course, when your mite levels get too high, even if you kill the mites, it could be too little too late to save your bees. So you've got to have a comprehensive strategy to keep mite levels low. Um, in the Northeast, people often want to know when they should treat their mites. Uh, and so this is a chart that we use that is, is based on a, a number of um, economic impact thresholds that have been calculated. But essentially, earlier in the year in May, if you're finding 2% mite infestation or higher, it's a good idea to treat because that 2% is going to become 3, 4, 5, 6% by the end of the year. In August, if your mites are, are at 3% or higher, then you may not need to treat, uh, or rather you may need to treat at 3%, but not at 2% uh, infestation because you know in August, 3% might turn into 4% in, in September, and maybe that's not enough to kill your bees. Um, Many people though are, are increasingly opting to try to stay below 2% as their main goal. If they ever get above 2%, they want to treat. Other people would rather stay below 1%. And you know, obviously we'd all like to stay at 0%, but as we've discussed, that's hard to do. Um, I want to very quickly run through chemical control and I'm mindful that, that we've got limited time before we're supposed to switch to questions. But I will just quickly talk about a few different control mechanisms that, that you might think about for managing your mites. And particularly, keep in mind the, the, um, the fact that we're going into spring and what spring mite management might uh, need to look like. So in some ways, we can look at this list of miticides and, and say, hooray, fantastic. We've got all of these fantastic weapons to use against the varroa mites. But if you pause for a moment, you can think, why would we keep inventing new miticides if we just had miticides that worked. And the reality, unfortunately, is that over time, the varroa mites have evolved resistance to some of these. There are a lot of issues with some of these miticides, things like uh, apistan, talfuvalinate, or fumafos. These uh, both were very, very effective. They killed 99% of mites until they killed 90% of mites, until they were only killing 60%, until suddenly they weren't killing very many at all. Uh, and so people continued to, to switch from these miticides to new ones in the hopes that, that they could finally find the permanent mite control strategy. But even Amitraz, which is marketed as, as Apivar, is we're increasingly finding more and more reports of reduced effectiveness, that it's not having the effect it used to. And that's probably because the more of a, of a pressure you put on those mites to evolve resistance to something, the more you know, likely you are to see that resistance emerge. If one lucky mite gets a mutation, she can spread and spread and spread her genes as she has more and more offspring who continue to survive the treatment. There are these other treatments as well, formic acid, thymol, oxalic acid, hops beta acids. All of these various products have some complexities to them. They might not kill mites quite as effectively as, as apistan did. They might not be usable all times of year. And so it's important to understand what options are available um, and, and so I want to very quickly talk about them here. It's critical to remember that the label is the law. Whatever chemical we're talking about, the, the printed label on the miticide that you have purchased to treat your bees is the law that you need to be following. And so anything that I say, if it's in conflict with the label, don't listen to me, listen to the label. Um, make sure that you are following the instructions, you know, certainly US-based US beekeepers um, who, are, who are treating need to follow the US law and, and the US labels on these products. So uh, what are some of the options available and, and are they suitable for spring use? Um, well, there's Amitraz, uh, which is marketed as Apivar. Amitraz is generally permissive at a lot of different temperatures, but it's not safe to use while you have honey supers on. It's a synthetic pesticide and you don't want that getting into you know, the honey stream. You don't wanna have that show up at the farmer's market. And so you put these strips on, they're impregnated with the chemical, and they need to be left in for a long period of time so that all of the mites wind up getting exposed to them. You then need to remove the strips and leave your bees for another two weeks before you can start putting honey supers on. So what that means is that if you start an Apivar treatment right now, and then you've got to leave this long period of time during the treatment and then after the treatment is removed, you might not be able to put any honey supers on your bees until June, 
But if you don't put any extra space on your bees before June, you're very likely to have a lot of very swarmy bees because they're going to run out of space very quickly. And so this is usable in the spring, but only if you have a really good sense of when your honey flow starts and you use this before that honey flow has already, you, know, you use it so that you can have it removed and removed for two weeks before your honey flow begins. Uh, a product like formic acid is a, a great product uh, marketed as Mitoway Quick Strips or Formic Pro in the US, but it's very sensitive to temperature. If it's below 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside, or if it's above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the gas, the formic acid vapor, is not going to effectively leave the pads and, and kill the varroa mites that you want it to. So it is safe to use while you've got honey supers on, and it may be suitable for spring if you get a day that's, or, or rather a two week period, uh, that's between 50 degrees and, and 85 degrees. But it's, you've got to be mindful that if your temperatures are already jumping into really high uh, levels, they're getting above 80 or above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, this may not be a suitable treatment for you. Uh, thymol is again very permissive about temperature. Uh, thymol or thymol, both pronunciations are appropriate, but it's derived from the, the herb thyme, and so I, I say thymol. Um, the, it is not safe to use with honey supers on. Um, I don't know that it would be terribly toxic to do so, but it certainly makes your, your honey smell like sort of thyme or, or like mint, um, which is unappealing and, and not the kind of thing you want to be consuming. Um, and so this is something that may be suitable, but it, it has that same problem as the, the Apivar, as the, the Amitraz product, that you need to have it, you know, the treatment completed and the, this residue removed before you start putting on honey supers, making your harvestable crop. And then there's apibioxal, um, which is a, an oxalic acid product. Uh, oxalic acid can be used at a very wide range of temperatures. And there are a few different ways you can use it. You can use the dribble method where you mix some with sugar uh, syrup and then dribble that in between seams of bees uh, as your bees are, are sitting in the colony. Very recently, the, this has now been, been approved for use in the United States while honey supers are on. And so you can safely use oxalic acid with supers on, but oxalic acid is not as effective the more brood your bees have. It doesn't kill the mites under the brood caps, and the more brood you have, the more of those mites are going to be off reproducing and won't be exposed to the oxalic acid. Um, uh, vaporization is another common and popular method. It, it poses a lot more risk to the applicator if you're not wearing your respirator and your goggles and your gloves. But uh, beyond that, it has the same problem as the dribble method, which is that it doesn't really kill varroa mites that are underneath the brood caps. So if you've got no brood, it's a great you know, product or, or, or a great treatment to use. If you have lots of brood, it, it might not be the thing that I've reached for first. Uh, and then finally, something like HopGuard 3 is based on hops beta acids. It's very similar to oxalic acid in that it is safe to use with honey supers on, but it, it is only killing the phoretic mites. And so this is something you can use to knock your mite levels down, but you shouldn't expect it to kill 99.9% .9 of the varroa mites in your colony. So when I, whenever I talk about these chemicals, the question that I always get is, which chemical control is best? What's the best one? And I always need to point out that that's the wrong question. What you need to keep in mind is that these different chemicals that you might use are all different weapons in your mite control arsenal. They're really good tools to have. They're tools to understand. You might even want to have some you know, handy. But different compounds might not be effective because of mite resistance. They might not be terribly effective. Maybe they just don't kill all that many of the mites. They might be unsuitable because the temperature is too high or too low. Or they might be unsuitable because you've got a lot of brood, and so they aren't going to be quite as effective. Uh, and they may not be appropriate because you've got honey supers on. You don't want to be using you know, uh, Apivar when you, when you have honey being produced for human consumption. So you have to understand each of these and their strengths and weaknesses, and then decide how you want to deploy them against the mites. So for springtime treatments, what are the, the best options available to you? Well, Apivar, as I said, is suitable as long as you can get it off and off for two weeks before your supers go on. Is Formic Pro suitable? Well, it's, it's temperature sensitive and it's likely to kill a few of your larvae. It'll kill some brood. That's fine most of the time. It's not gonna kill all of your brood as long as you use it properly. But if your bees are weak and you're trying to get them to grow in the spring, 
it might not be my favorite thing to reach for if I know that I'm going to be knocking that growth down and, and, and back a little bit. Uh, something like Tymol, again, you don't want to be putting that on if you have any supers on, but you could use it beforehand. And then oxalic acid and HopGuard 3, the more brood you have, the less effective these are likely to be. And so if you've got a broodless period, then they're, they're terribly effective, but otherwise um, they, they may not be the first thing to reach for. And there are non-chemical mite control tools or techniques as well. Things like drone comb trapping, where you're going to, to take a frame of drone comb, put it into a colony, and then take advantage of that mite preference for drones to go in, they'll infest them all, the cells will all get capped, and then you can pull the, pull the mites out and, and the drones out, pull the, the capped cells in their entirety, and discard them or put them in a freezer, kill all the mites and drones, and then have your bees clean out all of the leavings after you've killed everything inside those cells. It's a really good method as long as you can stick to a schedule, because if you can't, what you're doing is just breeding more and more mites in your colony. You're, you're giving the mites everything they've ever asked for, a whole big frame full of drones, and then allowing those drones to, to grow up and, and have, um, you know, produce all of those extra mites. You might consider some different methods to reduce the speed or extent or continuity of your bee population growth. If you keep your bees in smaller hives, if you allow your bees to swarm, that is going to induce brood breaks. And that might reduce the opportunities for those mites to just grow exponentially over the whole season. Most people don't want to have small hives that swarm all the time, but you could split your colonies. You could find big colonies in, the, in part of the year, split them, and then make smaller colonies that you can grow up. And during that splitting process, you'll wind up with a brood break. And so that might be a time to reach for one of those miticides that works best when there isn't very much brood in the colony. And you can also use mite resistant or mite tolerant bees. Uh, and so there, I have yet to see evidence of a perfectly mite proof bee, but there is a lot of evidence, including some of the work that I did in my doctoral dissertation on bee populations that are able to survive or bee breeding programs that are able to produce bees that are more resistant to mites. They can keep the levels lower. They can live more successfully if the mite levels get high. And so combining mite resistant bees with a non-chemical method like drone comb trapping with a chemical method like you know, Formic Pro or, or Apivar at some point throughout the year can be a really effective way to build that integrated pest management strategy, build that comprehensive holistic um, mite control strategy that is informed by your understanding of varroa mite biology. Uh, now I see that I've, I've gotten to the point I was supposed to stop. And so instead of uh, going any further, I think we can just stop right here and I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, but it is you know, my, my hope and my intent through this process to have helped you build a better understanding of varroa mites, have an understanding of how they can spread between colonies and also to really have, have gotten you know, more insights that can help you build your mite control strategy. My one key piece of advice to you is if you are trying to build a mite control strategy, if you've got bees and you are not perfectly controlling your varroa mites, then you should be asking other people what they're doing. Lots of people will tell you what they do to control varroa mites, but it's important to figure out whether or not what they do is actually working. So don't go to the loudest member of your local bee club. Go to the person who is most successfully keeping their bees alive year after year. Figure out what they're doing and then think about adopting their varroa strategy. Um, and so there are a lot of resources available. You know, you can contact us at Better Bee. You can talk to your state bee inspector. You can talk to your local bee club. But it's important to continue to have conversations about what's working and what's not working so that we can actually keep our mite levels low continuously and not be breeding mites over here that are then going to transmit themselves or, or get transmitted by bees into all of the colonies nearby that other people are trying to keep healthy. Uh, all right, uh, I think with that, I will, I will stop sharing uh, and we can, we can jump to questions if you'd like. I, yeah, we've got 12 questions. Splendid. Can you see them? I can if I click on the right button. There we all are. All right. Um, so I can just run through them from top to bottom. Uh, so has there been any research on varroa transmission from bee to bee based on the mites interest in abandoning a sick bee and attaching to a healthy one? That's a great question. So the, um, 
yes, there has been research on this idea, the idea that, that the Varroa mites are going to leave you know, unhealthy bees and get onto healthier ones. Um, more importantly than that, I suppose, is, that, is whether or not the Varroa mites are preferentially leaving a sick colony, a colony that might be on its way out, a colony that might be failing, uh, and then getting into healthier colonies that way. Um, the, the data are not conclusive, but a number of experiments have suggested that yes, that the sicker a colony gets, the more of the Varroa mites are going to be shifting their, their preference onto colonies that might be able to spread, um, uh, onto bees that might be able to spread them to other colonies. So shifting from riding around on nurse bees to riding around on foraging bees means that you are going to go out on drifting bees, perhaps, because they're out flying and might drift uh, into other colonies. It also means if, you, if, you're, if your Varroa scent preference is for a forager, you might also find a robber really attractive. So you might jump onto a foreign robber bee and get carried home that way. Um, this is another, uh, so William says, this is a data point that suggests we need a time-released organic acid product to guard the colony year round. Yes, so any Varroa uh, control method that you use, um, you need to be mindful of, of whether it's able to protect your bees continuously. If you do, if we do have a, um, uh, a time-released organic acid product, um, whether it's organic acid or something else, you know, it's important to understand that that is one tool in the arsenal, but it's probably not going to be the only thing we have to do. We can't look for a silver bullet, you know, magic mite resistant bee. We also can't look for a silver bullet mite treatment because we had that in Apostan and it worked perfectly until the mites evolved resistant. And then we had it in Kumafos until they evolved resistance even faster. So the strategy of saying, what's my one thing, what's my one perfect tool is, is never going to be good. But yes, a continuous release of, of a miticide might be a good important part of our future mite control strategies. Um, someone says that their local beekeeping association has people who count mites and other people who don't and treat three to four times out of the year at the same interval is either more valuable. So the that's a, a great question. A lot of people say to me, David, I don't have time to monitor for mites and treat for mites, so why can't I just treat? The disadvantage is you don't know if your July treatment that you've always done is actually necessary in June if you don't monitor in June. Find out, hey, my mite levels are way higher than they normally are, better treat. Um, but if you only have time for one thing, don't monitor and then not treat. Go ahead and treat. That's a perfectly fine strategy. It means that you're a little bit more in the dark about when, whether a treatment was needed or whether the treatment worked. But as far as I'm concerned, monitoring my bees for mites, the only thing that that really gives me is an excuse not to treat. If I go in and I monitor and all of the bees in an apiary have only 1% mite infestation, I'm gonna save myself a little money and say, I don't have to do a treatment right now. I think my bees are fine. Maybe next month I do. But if I don't have the time to do that, I just have to go ahead and treat every time you know, my, my schedule tells me to. And hopefully that schedule is based on the successes of, a, of another beekeeper who has been doing that and having success. Um, <clears throat> with an emphasis on treating for mites, doesn't it result in more uh, resistant mites and weaker bee genetics? Are feral bees not being treated? Um, uh, sorry. Are, are Feral wild bees that are not being treated varroa, weakening managed colonies by introducing varroa or varroa treated hives with low mite resistance, introducing weak genetics into feral colonies. Right. So this is, a, this is an ongoing question and conversation that people have been having um, about the idea of, of taking our, our varroa mites and not treating them, allowing our bees to, to grapple against them for a while, and then maybe having some mite resistant bee that emerges and solves the varroa mite problem once and for all. Um, I will tell you, as someone who did my doctoral work in um, uh, the Arnott Forest, which is where Professor Tom Seeley at Cornell, my PhD advisor, uh, has been studying this population of survivor bees that are able to persist without varroa treatment, I will tell you that you know, in the first case, yes, those bees have mite resistance traits. When we look for mite resistance traits that we already know and recognize, those bees have them. And they, they actually don't just have one, they have multiple mite resistance traits at once. However, we also know that if we take those bees and we put them into 10 frame hive equipment, we put them in a dense apiary, 
and then we, we prevent swarming and have them grow and make lots and lots of honey, they can die from varroa mites just like other bees. Maybe a little bit slower, but it's not like they're totally mite-proof. And so understanding what it means to have a, a treatment-free program and, and what that implication might be for your neighbor's hives who can pick up mites from you um, is important. So the, the rule of thumb that I always use when people ask me about whether we should be thinking about uh, going treatment free, not, not treating for varroa mites, letting the weak colonies die and only keeping the strongest ones is two things. First of all, it's very easy to take a hundred colonies, decide you're not going to treat and then watch as varroa mites kill a hundred colonies. And now you've got no bees. So if you don't have the genetics in the first place that are gonna make your bees totally mite resistant, you can just watch a lot of bees die and not achieve very much. The other thing is, if you have a treatment-free treatment -free beekeeping program, and it involves less time, less effort, less mite monitoring, less uh, research, less understanding of mite and, and bee biology, than if you just went to the store, bought some treatments, and used them, you're not doing it correctly. If you want to do it right, you've got to be studying all of these things. You've got to have a good understanding of evolutionary, you know, co-evolution between parasites and hosts. And you've also got to either be completely isolated from your neighbors or have the agreement of all of your beekeeping neighbors that you're all going to go treatment free together. Because if not, you're a jerk. You're breeding a bunch of disease that we know can spread easily into your neighbor's hives. Uh, and so it's important to understand that yes, you can be a treatment free beekeeper, but that doesn't mean that you just sort of lazily don't worry about parasites, don't buy medicine and hope that your animals are okay. Uh, because I've, I've never seen anyone who's done that and had success. You've really got to dedicate yourself to it if, you, if you're going to get much out of things. Um, we have a new beekeeper who is doing alcohol washes by picking off 100 drones. Would this be a good indicator? So no. Well, maybe. The, so the idea of, of going and just plucking 100 drones and then putting them in the alcohol wash um, is going to tell you something but you can't compare that to the alcohol wash numbers that other people have because they're not plucking a hundred drones and washing them in alcohol and seeing how many mites there are. The mites are preferentially riding on nur female nurse bees. That's where they spend most of their time, they feed on them, and then they are right in the brood nest so they can jump in and reproduce in some more brood. Um, only under severe circumstances do you tend to find these mites in, in older bees, you know, the foragers and things like that. And so um, you, you were getting data, you can use those data, but you can't compare it to what I'm reporting or what somebody else is reporting because they're going into the brood nest, taking 300 of their worker bees and then doing the alcohol wash on them. Uh, do viruses transmitted from mites spread from bee to bee or only directly from a feeding mite? So as I said, the varroa transmitted viruses, as far as we know, uh, none of them came from varroa mites. They all came from the bees. And so they were spreading naturally by the bees, um, you know, defecating and then being exposed to each other's feces or more likely just sticking their mouth parts together and exchanging nectar or other foods that way. Uh, and so the mites were, were, rather the viruses were spreading in those colonies naturally that way. What the varroa mites have done is just added an extra transmission mechanism. So if you think about something like uh, HIV, uh, in humans, HIV can be spread through um, you know, sexual relations between people, but it can also be spread by using a hypodermic needle to use intravenous drugs. Just because somebody has gotten HIV from intravenous drug use, that doesn't mean that they can't then spread it through the natural mode of, of you know, sexual behavior. And so um, you're, not, you're not eliminating that possibility for virus spread just by having the, um, just by having the the additional transmission via the mites. Um, why isn't the goal 0% infestation? Uh, and and would, that would lead you to ask about constant treatment spring to late fall, early winter. So um, uh, in some ways, the goal is 0% is infestation. If I could have bees with mites or bees with no mites, even though I'm a varroa scientist, I'd rather have bees with no mites. Um, however, it is, it is very, very difficult to kill all of your mites, and the stress of using treatments continuously or, or varying the treatments on your bees is not zero. It's not negligible. It's not nothing. So if I use formic acid on my bees, it'll kill mites, but it'll also kill a few bees. If I use oxalic acid, if I use the oxalic acid dribble on my bees repeatedly throughout the year, 
we know that the more times you do that, the more mortality you're going to start seeing in your worker bees. And so continuous treatment, no matter what it is, has the potential to harm the bees. And so depending upon how therapeutically useful it is and how, how critical the, you know, getting the mite level from 0.5% down to 0%, is it, it winds up being more beneficial to say, mites at 0.5, I'm gonna leave them alone. Mites at you know, two, maybe it's time to go in and do a treatment. I'll kill a few more bees, but I'm also gonna kill a lot of those mites. Uh, so it, it becomes that balancing act. If somebody made a continuous mite control product that would kill mites and wouldn't cause any stress to the bees and didn't cost a fortune for the beekeeper, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to use. Um, but what we consistently find is that you know, monitoring your mite levels, understanding where you're at, and then and then knocking the mite levels down only when you get above those those economically relevant thresholds, those thresholds where you're likely to have your your whole colony die if you don't treat, um, winds up having a, a better effect. Uh, at a two percent or one percent treatment threshold, aren't we at the limits of error with our testing modes? So there is a danger, yes, that if you are looking for one percent mite infestation and you're doing something like a, a, an alcohol wash or a sugar shake where 1% infestation is going to be three varroa mites. And so if there's a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of plus or minus where you might not always detect every mite, uh, if you're using the sugar shake in particular, there's concerns that you're not dislodging every single mite and detecting them. Um, is it possible that, that if you're trying to keep the mites below 1% and, and you know uh, only treating if you get, or, below 2% and you detect 1%, that there could be a little bit of an error in there. And that in fact, your mites are, are going to be um, uh, you know, at that 2% level that you should have been treating. Uh, that's a concern. I mean, it's, it's a valid concern. Um, the reality is if we wanted perfect accuracy, if I wanted to know exactly how many mites were on my bees, I could figure it out very easily. I'd just take every single bee in the colony and I'd kill them all with alcohol. And then I can figure out how many mites there are. The issue is I'm sacrificing bees to do that test. If I wanted a worse test, I could take 50 bees and figure out, you know, kill them, kill them and the mites on them with alcohol and see how many mites there are. That'll let me know if my levels got really high, but it's not going to let me make distinctions between 1% and 2%. So you have to accept that there is error in the measurement and that, you know, if you, if you measure 10 colonies in an apiary and you get, you know, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 2%, maybe you don't need to treat, or maybe you would just treat the one that, that scored 2%. If you're monitoring and you get 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 4%, maybe it's time to treat, even if there might be some wiggle room that would, that would suggest that, you know, that those 2% weren't, weren't at that absolute critical level. I hope that makes sense. Um, can you use oxalic acid with supers on in New York State? So the, the current New York, uh, federal law is, if the oxalic acid that you have purchased, the, the, and so AP Bioxyl is the product that Better Bee sells, and it's, as far as I know, the only product available in the US that you can buy that is, is certified for use to treat you know, honeybees. Um, if you buy it from Better Bee today, it is going to come with a label on it from the EPA that says that you can safely use it while honey supers are on. If you bought it from us last year and you've got some kicking around, it won't have that label. And according to federal law, it therefore wouldn't be legal for you to use it using the new updated guidelines. Um, you'd have to buy new product, even though the crystals are going to be identical to each other. So um, I hope that everything that I've just said is legally compliant and gives you a good picture of, of how things work. But, but I will tell you that in Europe, for a long time, people have been able to use oxalic acid while um, uh, while they have had honey supers on and there have been no noted ill effects and that now the, the FDA and the EPA have agreed that it is safe to sell pure oxalic acid crystals for use treating bees with supers on. And if, so if you have pure oxalic acid crystals from another source, you can make your own conclusions there. Um, uh, so the drone comb trapping method is, is yeah, I, I covered that only very briefly. The idea is that you take a frame that has drone comb, larger diameter cells that only drone bees are raised inside of. You put that inside your colony and your queen fills it up with drone eggs. The colony is typically pretty starved for drone comb. Uh, mostly we just give them worker comb. And so they'll see that and go, fantastic. Now we can raise a big batch of males and then we'll spread our genes and they'll go mate with queens elsewhere. So they'll raise a lot of drones, and then you, the beekeeper, very carefully monitors 
when those cells get filled with eggs, when those cells start to get capped, and before those cells get uncapped, you need to go in and pull the frame out. What you've got inside of that, those cells, those capped cells, are drone bees who are growing up and being, you know, they were fed lots of pollen. It took a lot of effort to, to grow them up. So it's not like there's zero cost there. But as you feed those, those uh, as you take those drones out, you're also taking out all of the varroa mites that jumped in to those cells and started reproducing. So if you take that frame out and put it into your freezer for 24 hours, 48 hours, you're going to kill all of the drones and you're going to kill all of the mites. And so then you can take the frame out, let it thaw. You don't want to put an ice cube back in your hive, but let it thaw and stick that back into your colony. And your bees can go in and they can, they can rip out all of those dead drones, rip out all of those dead mites and throw them away. And so if you do that, then it's possible your queen's gonna lay a whole batch of new drone eggs and the bees are gonna start raising a whole batch of, of new drones. And you can take it out again at the appropriate time when those drones have been capped, but not before they start to get uncapped and have all of their mites spilling out into the colony. So you can do it a few times. It's actually particularly effective in the spring because your bees are motivated to make a bunch of males that they'll you know, try to keep alive throughout the rest of the season. Um, however, in the spring, when your bees are trying to grow their colony size, make a lot of workers, if you have them rearing all of these drones and then you're taking them away and killing them, that's a lot of pollen, that's a lot of protein, that's a lot of foraging effort that's being wasted. So you need to be mindful of the fact that this, yes, no chemicals are, need to be purchased, no chemicals are, are put into the colony, um, but you, you do have some costs that your bees are still paying. There's still a stress by stealing all of those drones and, and all of that protein from them. Do I recommend keeping the reducer in the brood supers all season long? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I totally follow the, the question, unfortunately. Um, uh, if, if you are talking about an entrance reducer or the, so if you're talking about an entrance reducer to reduce robbing or, or drift, um, I do typically reduce my entrance some throughout the year. Uh, I, I actually, I just have a, for the width of my hives, I just have a, a little block that's about half of that width. And I, I leave that in typically year round. Uh, and occasionally I'll take it out if I'm doing a treatment or if I, if I really wanna help the bees cure some honey quickly. But otherwise I, I do have a partially reduced entrance and I will sometimes reduce it even further. Is treating three times annually a reasonable routine spring, summer, and late fall also is using different miticides recommended? To the second question, absolutely. I would always encourage you to use multiple different miticides and to cycle between them um, because that's going to, to mean that you are not applying that strong evolutionary pressure to your mites to evolve resistance. If you use formic acid every year, you know, we don't know how or if mites can evolve resistance to it, but if they did, it would happen from someone who was using formic acid and nothing else. If you're using Amitraz, Apivar throughout the year, multiple times a year, that's going to apply a pressure for those mites to, to evolve resistance to that. Um, in terms of the first question, is it reasonable to have a spring, summer, and a fall treatment and do, do three a year? I would ask you, do you have colonies that are dying from varroa mites? If you do, and that's what you've been doing, it's clearly not a good strategy, it's not working. If that's what you're doing and you don't have a varroa problem, then it's clearly working reasonably well. The question there is, if you eliminated one of those treatments, would it still work just as well or not? Um, and so that gets into the, the trial and error side of this, is, is there's a lot of errors in varroa management. A lot of people look at their bees and go, oh, geez, I didn't keep the mites as low as I wanted this year. Um, the trial side of it is seeing what other people are trying and then trying that yourself until you settle upon something that will keep your bees alive. Um, does the age of the queen have any impact? Um, in, in terms of varroa management, as far as I know, uh, no, with one caveat, I suppose. If you have a very young queen, she's going to probably be loaded and ready to lay lots and lots of brood, and so the colony might grow very quickly in the spring in particular. Um, an older queen who might be starting to fail, might be running out of sperm, might be laying fewer eggs overall, uh, she could... Um, you know, potentially have a slower spring buildup, which would mean also sort of a slower mite population uh, increase. But that's not a, a terribly good queen for you to be keeping. So you would probably be better served replacing her and then 
treating for, treating for the mites. Have scientists figured out a way to re raise Varroa in the lab? Uh, if not, why is it so difficult? Um, there, are, there are techniques that can be used to grow Varroa. Um, it essentially involves essentially growing bees uh, and then having those bees um, uh, live in an incubator that you maintain. Um, and so that can be done, but it is not, uh, it's not as easy as you might hope. And it's not, unfortunately, teaching us quite as much as we would like to learn. Um, one advantage, I guess, of, of Varroa mites is that even if they're hard to grow in the lab, they're really easy to grow in a beehive. One of the things I always told people when they, when they said, oh, what an interesting PhD subject studying Varroa mites and bee behavior, you know, so, so you're a beekeeper then. And I said, well, not really. I'm a Varroa mite keeper. And a Varroa mite keeper just has to be a really bad beekeeper because the Varroa mites keep themselves as long as you aren't taking good care of your bees. Uh, and so it's not hard as a researcher in varroa biology to have plenty of varroa mites to work with. Uh, it is hard to make a lot of honey, keep your bees alive throughout the year, and have all of the other beekeepers nearby, you know, be friendly to you. Um, how soon should you monitor after a treatment? Uh, there are different strategies. If you're using like a screened bottom board, you can actually monitor during the treatment and see how many mites are falling while the treatment is in. And then you could leave that screen bottom board in, use a sticky board underneath and see how many mites are falling, you know, in the next couple of days afterwards, um, after the treatment has, has ended. Um, uh, if you're using some of the sample-based methods, you know, you could do it at any time. There are, there are pros and cons to waiting a little bit. So some treatments will weaken the mites and then won't actually kill them for a few days, uh, or, or even, you know, you, they might kill the mites or weaken the mites underneath the brood caps. But they're not going to be. Um, uh, they're not going to be. Uh, how do I want to say that? They're not going to be effective enough to. Um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. I'm reading. I'm reading the other questions as I'm trying to answer them, which is a terrible habit of mine. But I get excited about what I get to talk about. And I'm forgetting what I'm saying. Um, I think my short answer. I, I think I've, I've basically covered uh, whatever the question was, and unfortunately, it's disappeared. But if not, somebody ask it again. Um, if you have 12 hives in an apiary, how many do you test or treat? Uh, so the, that's a great question. If you can test all 12, why not? You'll learn a lot more. If you don't have the time or the inclination to do that, don't just treat the biggest colonies because the biggest colony might be the healthiest. And so you won't notice the sick one full of mites. If you, if you just test the smallest, weakest colony, then you're not going to detect you know, all of the, the giant mite growth that has happened in your big colony or all of the mites that they've picked up by robbing. So my recommendation is if I'm only treating, let's say, or testing, let's say three mites in an colonies in an apiary for mites, I'm going to test my biggest colony, my smallest colony, and whatever my most average colony is. Whatever rules I use, I'm gonna find somebody who seems like they're in the middle and I'm gonna test them. If I could add two more, then I would, I would add more to sort of cover that span because I don't want to bias myself by picking the strongest bees or the weakest bees. Could a mite receiver colonies be strategically placed and treated more often to help keep mite numbers in check in an apiary? No. So you can't, you can't basically set up one colony who's going to slurp up all of the varroa mites and let you treat them because unfortunately the mites are, are spreading pretty widely uh, and via both drift and robbing, it's sort of hard to predict where they're going to go. So you have to assume for the most part within an apiary, I assume that there's enough drift happening and then potentially robbing if any colony gets weak enough that all of my colonies are sharing their varroa mites. And that's pretty consistently what I find. If I test every colony in an apiary, it's likely that I'm going to see you know, some colonies that have higher levels and some colonies that have lower levels. But in general, if this apiary has really high mites, they'll all have pretty high mites. Whereas if this apiary consistently has low mites, basically all of those colonies will have low mites. All right, one more question. One question. Goodness, but there are so many interesting ones. Um, well, uh, perhaps Pat, would you like to choose the, the remaining question out of the, the ones that are on here? Uh, the next one. Okay. Uh, so what are my thoughts about drone trapping and herding genetic availability for spring virgins? Yes, that's a good point. If you're using the drone comb trapping method and you, you are giving your bees an opportunity to make a lot of drones, but then you are removing and killing all of those drones, 
is that going to mean that if you've got a virgin queen produced in, you know, if that colony swarms the next day and now there's a virgin queen who has to go out and mate, now none of your bees are going to have drones that can go and mate with those virgins because of course they've been, um, they've been uh, killed. Um, for the most part, I have not seen folks using drone comb trapping and successfully killing all of their drones. And it's important to remember that a colony makes more drones than you, the beekeeper, really need them to, because it's not, you know, the, they are trying to get genetic success. And so they'll, they'll make males willy-nilly in the hopes that those males can go out and, and you know, fertilize as many queens as possible. Um, it's unlikely that a colony, even if you're doing drone comb trapping, will have no drones. And if you have multiple colonies in the apiary, if they're not all getting drone comb you know, trapped, then some of them can make the drones that will then fertilize all of the other uh, you know, virgin queens in the area. And of course, if you kill every drone in your apiary, if your neighbor isn't doing the same thing, if the swarm that moved into the tree two years ago that has somehow managed to survive hasn't you know, had their drones removed, then you're still going to be very likely to have um, your varroa mites, uh, sorry, varroa mites, you're still, still very likely to have drones available for your queens to mate with. Uh, so it's a concern, it's a thought, it's, it's a cost to the bees, it's a cost to the sort of drone population overall. Um, but in my experience, drone comb trapping is not the thing that's going to eliminate any possibility of drones to mate with your virgin queens. It's bad weather that means that no colony anywhere in the area is raising drones. It tends to lead to the most poorly mated queens, in my experience. Well, terrific. Thank you, everybody. I've, I've been very pleased to talk to you. I'm sorry I couldn't answer more questions or give more of my overly long lecture, but uh, I hope everyone found this useful. Um, if you are at all interested in, in you know, talking to me, you, I, I'm the Director of Research and Education at Better Bee. You can call us up and, and ask to speak to me, and I'll be right there. You can email us. Uh, you can email me at education at betterbee.com. I'm always happy to talk to folks. If you'd like me to give a Zoom talk to your local bee club or you know, or maybe even fly me out and, and have me come give a talk to you. I'm always happy to do that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, use us as a resource, use New York Bee Wellness as a resource, reach out to, to trustworthy beekeepers in your local bee club, figure out what works in your area. And I think most importantly, you know, keep in mind that, that the loudest voice on an issue or the loudest voice in, in beekeeping isn't necessarily the most trustworthy. So talk to folks who are actually keeping their bees alive successfully. You know, it better be. I've been helping with the varroa management since I arrived here. And right now we're looking at 90% overwinter survival in a lot of our, our nuke yards. So if that's something that you'd like and you're not achieving it, then maybe my advice is worth listening to. Um, if you've got 100% survival and I only have 90%, then clearly I'm wasting your time. Uh, so make sure that the folks you listen to are having success. And if they aren't, you know, everybody needs to try something different. All right, thank you very much.